Hi everyone. So before, before I start, I um, actually had a dedication for this talk. Um, three um, three themes that have been that I've been carrying around and have been um, and just I've been feeling a lot um, during the last couple of weeks. The first one, um, and I the first one is actually Lil Nas X. So as a gay space cowboy, I um, I'm just really feeling the energy and the work that he's. Um, exposing into the mainstream world. Um, also my father, who is a construction worker, so if you see if you see a worker on the road in Houston with a bright neon green shirt, um, if you see them, please, you know, they're slow down, pay attention to their signs, and take a little moment of gratitude for the labor and the work that they do in building the city around us. Um, and lastly, um young for uh, mother me for the last couple of weeks and um, helping me in my journey to, um, as I continue and have for most of my life mothered everyone around me, trying to find and allow um, that space for me to be cared for and for my healing to also be part of the work that I do. Thank you. Um, yeah, so again, I'm Jose Eduardo Sanchez. I'm going to be talking today about um, food as language and methodology of confrontation in the context of place making and their work. Um, but first, a little bit about how I got here, right? Um, this is me, and I usually do workshop facilitation, so I'm like yeah. moving around and I want to be in the space, so um, just in, in case, you know, just to give you a heads up. Um, I'm a queer immigrant artist, cultural organizer, language worker, and popular educator. My social practice invites communities to create, transform, confront, and reclaim space spaces by experimenting with the alchemy of food, language, memory, and other forms of life making as a way to configure and actualize collective like, healing, justice, and liberation. Um, I know that's a lot of words, and uh, as someone who works with language, I'm always invested in being able to be understood. So I'm just going to talk about um, what I feel that means and what that means for me. Um, I was born in a small rural town in Colta, Puerto Parate, Guanajuato, Mexico, and I migrated to the U.S. at age nine with my family. Um, here in Houston. Uh, so Houston is home. Um, Houston is where I've grown community. Houston is where I've really um, po become politicized and also just found different ways to connect with the world as myself and as who I really am and want to be. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, that's how I feel about Houston right now. That's not always been the case. About two years, uh, but back in 2016, I actually moved to LA. Um, and I was, you know, I, I, I had a job, I wanted to be in a new city, but really what I realized was that I was running away from Houston, and I was running away from the life that I was um, living here. And a lot of it, um, and I just cannot say enough gratitude to Nicoletta for what she's already brought into the space, but you know, similarly, I was in a situation where the work that I was doing was um, eating me up a lot, and, and I was not able to who I was or even explore who I wanted to be because I was too caught up in this sort of um, in this sort of cycle of not only um, doing social justice organizing work but doing it through a nonprofit industrial complex and also doing it as part of working with communities who were my communities who I was that community right I've been organizing with domestic workers with restaurant workers with construction workers in Houston and across the US and that's my dad, that's my mom, that's my brother, that's my sister, those are my cousins, that's the neighbors and the people that I grew up with. So to me, it was never a job. To me, it was always part of what I thought I was supposed to be doing. Um, and and I, I still think that, but I think just in, in many, many different ways. Um, and throughout the presentation, I'm going to be talking a lot about food and language, and those two things are really present um, in the work that I do, and just in my realization, um, of um, this this project in particular, you can see a lot of that. Um, and so I think of this, um, I spent two years in LA, so I did end up moving. Um, I ended up coming back, um, I might say probably worse than, I, than when I left, um, <laughs> but um, that actually gave me the opportunity to finally um, get that, that healing that I was looking for, get that space for myself that I was looking for. And one of the first things that I did um, were the since I quit my job, I didn't have another full-time job. I wasn't really interested in working full-time at all, much less at any sort of institution. So um, I still needed to pay rent and you know pay my bills. So I started doing two things. 
One is that I um, started a, a catering, um, catering business with my sister, where we did a lot of work recreating recipes from our mom and grandmother and aunts um, while working, still connected to a lot of the um, communities that I was organizing with. And I even went to culinary school, I enrolled in culinary school at HTC. I was, you know, I was thinking, wow, this is something that I really want to do. Um, and I started interpreting and translating as part of Infinite Houston. I've been interpreting translating for, for, I mean, since I was nine years old and I came to the U.S. and I was interpreting for my mom at the hospital, but uh, professionally for the last 10 years, and so that was another way that I was making money. And I thought, well, that's great, I'm getting paid to cook for people and I'm getting paid to um, interpret and translate, which are both things that I love. But at the same time, um, while that was sort of, that created the space for me to arrive where I am right now, uh, I realized that in and of itself wasn't the end for me. In fact, it was only the very, very beginning of where I actually wanted to go with my work, where I actually wanted to go with my uh, social practice and my impact um, being back in Houston. So, um, this is, a, I'm gonna talk about a couple of the projects that I did in, um, in LA. So this is one called The Worker Body, uh, Food Justice and Language Justice. This is part of a public engagement residency that um, Antena Los Angeles, which I was part of when I was in LA, and Antena Aire, it's a sister collective, were part of at the Hammer Museum at UCLA, and it was, um, there were many different um, iterations of the public engagement uh, community events, but this one in particular focused on food justice. Um, and food, not just from the point of view of like this mythical thing um, that we love to romanticize, but also um, not just at the level of sustenance, but particularly through the entry point of labor, the labor and work that goes into um, getting our food to us, right? Everything from growing the food to the people who are making it, so that we can actually um, take, have access to that type of sustenance. So we worked again um, at the Aire Antena Los Angeles, another um, social uh, artist project called Cocina Abierta. They do experimental theater performance, working particularly with restaurant um, and kitchen workers. Um, back of the, they actually work mostly with back of the house folks, and uh, they use uh, this sort of, um, the performance piece as a way for workers to one, connect and take collective action, but also to be able to process and um, engage in this collective feeling about what they have to go through in the back of the house at all the restaurants throughout LA, right? Um, and also with an organization called Rock LA, a Restaurant Opportunity Center, they're more of a traditional sort of advocacy policy organizing group, um, but again, um, that was sort of the, what we wanted to highlight. And for me, it was really important to um, be in this space. I, my entry point, I, again, was language. I, I was interpreting. I was interpreting this and many of the other public engagement events. But as I kept participating in that, I realized that, one, I was seeing parts of myself and parts of what I wanted to be doing in that work. But at the same time, there were questions that I had that were not being answered by that work, that were not being included in that work, and that I wanted to um, find a way to, to figure it out, right? This is a, this is a, an image. Um, I don't know if anyone and folks can, can tell or, yeah, so this is from the 1992 LA uprising um, in Koreatown. And so when I moved to LA, I, I was working in, in Koreatown. That was my community. That was who I was organizing with. That was um, what also was paying me to, to be there. And I chose this picture in particular because, uh, for folks who don't know, during April uh, 1992, LA uprising, following the um, the verdict of the Rodney King trial, just a, a whole. I mean, there's I could spend hours talking about this, and I'm not going to talk about it because it's not my, my story. But this in particular, uh, these are two business owners in Koreatown, um, as you can see with guns. And the caption for the picture was this Korea, Korean business owners protecting their business. Right? And I think that um, a lot of what the narrative was, uh, both around that time and even now, uh, about the LA uprising included a lot of the conflict and the tension between Korean and black and brown communities. Um, particularly Korean, it uh, portrayed the Korean community as business owners and it portrayed the black and brown, uh, Latinx and African American community in South LA, in particular as rioters, as looters, as folks who were, you know, trying to take advantage of the situation. But what's really interesting is that a work that I, the work that I went to LA to do, um, I was working with an organization that started basically 
within a week of the LA uprising was to uh, build solidarity among Korean immigrant workers, Latinx immigrant workers, who were the folks employed by these Korean business owners and, their, and who were actually the majority of the time severely exploited, not being paid for the work, uh, being sexually harassed, being uh, uh, threatened with immigration, etc. Right. So there was this whole dynamic that I kind of fell into. As uh, I was like, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a job organizing in LA, great, you know, whatever, it'll be fine. But I actually came not only at this specific space and place, but also around the time when the 25th anniversary of the LA University was taking place, right? Um, so I think, so that led to um, the, the next project that I'm gonna share about. So this is uh, 1992, The Fire Shut Still Burn. And this was about a six month documentation project that um, really was focused on grappling with the legacies of anti-blackness, xenophobia, and division that resulted over the last 25 years. Um, and also challenging the community, right, to continue thinking about what that healing and solidarity can look like. Not only between Koreatown and South LA, but also between Black, Latinx, and Asian communities in general. And I started working with a lot of community members, um, workers, business owners, activists, folks who have been in living during, during the LA uprising to collect not just stories, but also pictures, artifacts, um, and just put together bit by bit, right? And I think as someone who was four years old when this happened, was also living out of the country, so I didn't even have sort of like this um, cultural or historical concept of it, um, it was really challenging to go in and try to understand this entire, you know, th this, both the, the, the events of the LA uprising, but also the whole history behind it and up to it. But at the same time, I think that gave me a, uh, an opportunity to uh, be more of a, a facilitator and someone who could guide a process so for other folks who both could answer those questions but more importantly were the ones asking and participating in that conversation, right? Um, and the, the culmination of the sort of the, the documentation project um, occurred in the in a public event that again continued that conversation um, and allowed folks to kind of brought, brought together the different pieces, right? The, that were part of this process. A lot of the, uh, the documentation process included one-on-one -on -one interviews or going to people's houses or, or going to people's businesses, but this actually brought in like hundreds of community members, right? Both people who had participated, but also people who uh, were just interested or wanted to learn more. Um, and we displayed all of the different artifacts and photos around, but also um, not only wanted to reflect on the last 25 years since the uh, LA uprising, but also thinking forward, what does what do the next 25 years look like? What are we actually? Um, because you know what I learned and what a lot of people reflected on is that unfortunately, although you can rebuild a store, you can uh, you know move to another house, you can pave a road, you cannot just that that simply um, fix all of the underlying issues that led to the LA uprising, right? That were way more complicated than you know. Um, people burning stores, people looting, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I think um, that was part of the conversation that, that I was hoping would happen and actually ended up happening. Um, it was a fully interpreted Korean, English, and Spanish conversation, which again was amazing to be able to see sit across someone who, you know, a, a Korean immigrant who doesn't speak either English or Spanish, talk to a recent arrival, uh, a, a worker from a restaurant who just came from Oaxaca, who also doesn't speak English, but whose first language is actually Mixteco, but who's speaking in Spanish because that is the language that's being interpreted, and actually have this whole sort of like, create this understanding and this realization about what the space and the history they're sitting in, but also what their relationship and moving on forward is. So um, again, that was really um, a really key part. Um, so I, I was living and working in Koreatown, but my second home or my second the space that I, I was part of in a really weird, complicated way was actually Boyle Heights. Um, and I don't know how familiar folks are with Boyle Heights in LA or what's happening right now around the discussions of gentrification and displacement, but um, it's, I mean, it's really tense. It's, I mean, I, I don't know if it's tense, it's, it's, it's violent because violence is going on in the communities. Gentrification and displacement is violence. So folks are responding like, people do when your community is being violated, when your community is being attacked and colonized, right? So I want to say that because there's a lot of sort of sensationalizing 
of what's happening in Boyle Heights, and it's actually like a very, um, very complicated, but also I think a really important way um, for just for us to talk about both art and also um, issues around place and space in general, right? Um, this is the um, now infamous um, Pukwai Art graffiti at the Nikonim Gallery. So um, if folks watch Vida, they kind of um, had an episode in it. It was really, really bad, actually. <laughs> this is a very bad understanding of it. But um, again, this was, this was part of the, um, the context, right? So galleries were moving into Boyle Heights, which had been traditionally, well, started out as a Jewish and Japanese neighborhood, and, but more recently, in the last few decades, turned into a mini Chickenex, Latinx, working class, uh, Mexican, uh, and Central American community, right? And so you have all these galleries, these like multi, that are not, I mean, we're not talking about like, oh, I really like art, let me, you know, rent a shop and, and display art. We're talking about galleries that had millions of dollars in investment, right, from these giant uh, developers. So this was all speculative, um, like capitalism sort of like undertaking, seeing like, oh, art, this is something that everyone likes. This is something that's really benign, and actually using it to come into the communities. Because when you have galleries like PSST, when you have galleries like Nick Building, and so many others that again are like like backed by multi-million dollar developers and investors, and who have all of these resources, it's not only increasing the property values, but it's also uh, making a statement about whose art, who is an artist, who gets to be called an artist, whose arts get to be valuable, uh, and also who gets to claim to that space, right? Um, this is another, um, the, I would say, not the beginning, but I think one of the, sort of the, the inception of uh, BAD, which is the Boyle Heights Alliance Against Art Washing and Displacement. And this was a, a group that I was part of, um, that we, that I accidentally helped co-found again by virtue of being, inter being the interpreter in a lot of meetings, it's good seat in spaces, that, put, put me in spaces that I never thought I would be in or else in LA. But um, this actually, myself and my uh, comrade Jen, uh, we made the announcement of the language justice announcement for the space. And this is at Pico, um, Pico Gardens, which is a public housing complex in Boyle Heights. Um, the, the thing about our role in this work, right, and what we saw ourselves doing, and in San Los Angeles was at that point working, you know, there was a residency at the Hammer. We were working with LACMA. We were being asked by the main museum, which is another kind of that. And then the ICALA, uh, the folks are actually coming to us. Oh, we want to make this bilingual. You know, we're opening this new uh, collection. We want to make sure it's bilingual and accessible. And again, and these were, you know, main museum was a pet project of a giant developer that was responsible for a lot of the displacement and, and evictions and just, uh, not just evictions from homes, but evictions from space uh, around downtown and Skid Row and, and sort of the, the revitalization, right, of LA. And, the other was ICALA, which again had a similar um, sort of context and background uh, of being near one of the Northeast uh, communities. And so what we were doing, we were in those spaces, we are also in these spaces, where um, this was actually a meeting that the community members had with uh, some of the owners from PSST Gallery and the Gallery. I think those were the two that, the two that showed up. Um, and everything, and, you know, when we think about translation interpretation on our folks. It's like, oh, well, we're going to invite the brand new space. Let's get, you know, let's get someone to interpret for the people who don't speak English, right? But I think what we, what we meant by solidarity work through language justice was that we were just such an interpreter. We were actually going to create a space such that, right, that community members who did not speak English, who did not have access to formal education uh, in a lot of times, and, um, and where the ones being pushed out of this community had a, had a chance to actually be, I don't, see, I don't know if it's on the same level, but to shift the power dynamic between these mostly wide, upper middle class, highly educated, um, resource gathering owners that were coming in to have a conversation, right? Like a conversation is not, when you have that imbalance in power, it's not a conversation. And so I think what, what language helped us do in this space and what our work as in Los Santos was actually shift the power in that space. And it wasn't just, I mean, you can see some people wearing interpretation headsets, we're sitting in a circle. Um, it's at, again, it's at Pico Garden, it's not at the gallery's office or like, um, you know, space, which you, they were invited, but invited people to go there. And so I think when, so when I think of space and language, these are the things that I'm talking about, right? Like, 
net language is not neutral, um, and space is not neutral either. And so when we're talking about place thinking, when we're talking about like um, what are what are conventions, I think those are things that I um, try to keep in mind. And so we can get a quote from a, so there's a great article, folks haven't read it, I highly recommend it, Magali Miranda and Caroline McKinley, it's an ablative grass. Um, and this was, again, part of what kind of led me to, to the guiding questions in this project, is who social practices get to count as art, and who gets to have housing, right? These are very, very simple questions. A, a lot of what I was reading in newspapers at that time was really, Framing, framing the issue around, oh, art versus housing. Like, what, what's better, what's more important, what's like, and, and I think that issue, that was not the, the, the question. The question was, who's, uh, who's an artist? Who's art, right? And who gets to have this ticket in, in housing? Um, language is a weapon, language as a weapon. I actually think that uh, language was a wound, and I used to talk about my language wound as someone who came in um, who came to the U.S. who had to learn English, who had to interpret first parents, and had to like, you know, sort of be in that in between. But I now think of language as a weapon, right? And another thing too that in informs the work that I do is that you cannot talk about language, especially on this continent, especially in this country, especially in this physical space that we're at, without talking about colonization, right? Language has been the most powerful and effective weapon of colonization in, in oppressing, in erasing, and annihilating controlling um, Native communities and other communities that were not uh, part of that, um, of, of, the, of the people in power. And so I think, again, as I said, language, um, when I'm thinking about language, I'm thinking about spoken language, I'm thinking about sign, tactile, but I'm also thinking about the ways that other parts of our lives that constitute our language, right? Um, I, I talk about language dominance, especially in, in a country like the U.S., as um, Every, you know, if you don't speak English, you want to make a doctor's appointment at Legacy Clinic right now. If you don't speak English, you want to enroll in classes at HCC right now. If you don't speak English and you want to go testify at City Hall as a, you know, citizen or resident of, of, the, of the city, you know, what are your options? What is that process like, right? And, and for folks uh, like myself, like the other people I see here, the, we know that one, usually there is no process, there is no way, and when there is a process or a way, it's so just it's so convoluted and long and inaccessible that you know folks are shut out of these what for a lot of us could be just basic needs, basic services, um, because of this language dominance and, and linguicism, right? And lastly, um, I want to talk about language justice as the tool or one of the frameworks that I and the colleagues in this work use um, to push back against the language dominance and linguism and ongoing colonization, which is the idea that we all have the right to speak in the languages in which we feel most comfortable, to be heard, understood, and to understand, right? Um, that sounds so basic and simple, but it's so inaccessible to so many people um, who, who live in this, in this country and this world. Um, not just that, but also the creation of multilingual spaces where no one language has to dominate over the other. When folks who are coming into it to who don't speak English are the ones that are given a headset, told to sit in the back, someone's going to whisper to you, you stigmatize, and sort of, you can passively listen to the conversation, but you actually wouldn't be able to be part of that, right? So, things I'm thinking about. Um, I also uh, think about so Sol Lewis' work and the idea that language itself, right, um, that ideas can be works of art and that language used to create ideas is in, its, in a lot of ways in itself art, right? In the, both in terms of conversations we have, but, but I, I love this example that I was just thinking of, reminding me of, of the kitchen. Um, so like food recipes are just like these beautiful, intimate, radical pieces of conceptual art. You know, I, what can be more intimate and more also can have more possibilities than a food recipe that you write that um, someone else is gonna open up in their kitchen and what they are actually going to create is going to be something completely different. But here you are, this person who wrote it, guiding them, like, <laughs> movement by movement, ingredient by ingredient, like, uh, just piece by piece. And you've never met, you don't know each other, there's like this, so yeah, so thinking about language as, it, and ideas as they, they, they themselves pieces of art. Um, and lastly, uh, another part of the, the just the language piece that informs my work is 
Um, I've been really fortunate to be part of Under Los Angeles, and in Houston, uh, and Ida, and just the super, super amazing collectives that really explore how critical use of language can help us reimagine um, and reorganize the words, the worlds that we inhabit, right? Um, and when I say reimagine, and when I think of reorganizing, I think of like in the beginning there was a word, and like you can speak like so much of what we can speak into existence comes through this this process, right? So wanting to explore that a um, little more. Uh, I don't know how long I'm on time, but I'm probably near the end, so I'm just gonna uh, talk about, these are just some examples of food as compensation, food as compensation. Um, my, when I was growing up in Mexico, every morning my uh, aunt would wake up. Well, the night before she would make the nixtamal, uh, the, the, the grind it, then she would wake up and have the masa and make the tortillas by hand, and I would go into their, like, she would talk to me, we would share stories, she'd make me what she would call una ranita, like a little frog, which is basically just like a fresh made tortilla, like right of the comal, with a sprinkle of salt and a little water. Just, I, I guess, like moisten it, like roll it up, and that was my little sign as I went to school, right? So when Nicoleta was talking about the, just food, the alchemy of food, but also the kitchen is a cathedral, this was my cathedral. This was where I went every morning to pray, to start my day, to be thankful for um, what I had and what I wanted to do. Um, yeah, so I see that piece too. Um, this is, I don't know if folks have seen this image before as well, but this is actually the, re, um, the recovered uh, or re-excavated kitchen in Monticello um, that was where James Hemings used to cook, right? Uh, and again, James Hemings is someone who just, the more I've been <coughs> learning about <coughs> his life and the legacy that it's like basically food in the U.S. American food is is thanks to this man who was enslaved, who was owned by Thomas Jefferson, right? One of the writers of the Declaration of Independence, one of the former um, presidents. Uh, American food <laughs> is essentially thanks to this in level of ingenuity, um, and so bringing that into the space as well. Um, the, uh, Food is confrontation is literally the, uh, the sit-ins of the lunch counters, right? This is an image from um, just here in Houston, actually in Alameda, so not, not too, too far from here. Um, this is another, another example of a share, a hunger strike at, um, so immigrant folks who were detained at this detention center in Tacoma. This actually happened many times at the Tacoma Center and also many times in other detention centers around the, um, the country. but. It's not just the food is competition, but it becomes this discourse, right? Where um, for, like folks who are detained are not eating, are hungry, like, and then the guards are forced eating them, right? There is like it's it's um, the sort of back and forth. Um, similarly, with it's at you you are at the lunch counter. There's gonna be there's a response, right? There's there's gonna be a response. Um, folks, uh, another <laughs> example of food is competition, right? And in this in particular, we're talking about criminalization, but we're talking about food in public space. This was a Lake Mary. This was like, you know, we're not talking about, I mean, not that it, it would be a okay anyway, right? But um, yeah, bring that in. Uh, again, just one main conflict kitchen, which I think is, uh, has also just been really important in my development of the, of the project. Um, thinking of imperialism, again, thinking of conflict. Food. Um, Chef Johnny Rhodes, I don't know if folks have gone to go to Indigo yet. Um, it's actually my neighborhood. I live very close, um, very street. But um, I, I, the more I learn about the space, and, I mean, when that fellowship check hits, I'm going to go and spend you know, $130. But yeah, but the idea, right, that, um, that the, the ingenuity, the, the creation of the, the intentionality of the creation of the space to share, right, like this legacy of soul food uh, in a way that's confronting people, not in a way that's like, hey, come, take this really cool thing, let's have a conversation, but uh, being in your face about something that you know to be true and something that you, uh, you know its importance. So lastly, just to uh, share my questions. Um, so what I wanted to do in exploring um, food and language in the report uh, was ask questions like, what institutions like a very soul food, this is it, and French chicken have to say about the new past? 
what can newer places like Doshi House, Green Eats, and Slow Vegan tell us about its future? And what about some of those harder voices to hear, right? Like the front door barbecue or the chicken fry that feeds the neighbors, or the boudin or pies that get made and sold out of someone's kitchen. Um, likewise, how do these places also tie into the long traditions and realities in the community, such as black veganism, or safari, etc.? Um, I'd be remiss if I did not mention this. This is my last slide. Um, the tur turkey, like I, I submitted the proposal, and I had been thinking about this idea, and I, and I submitted the proposal about a month and a half before this happened. But um, when I was thinking about a language of food and food discrimination, when the lawsuit happened with the Turkey Leg Hut, when just the whole drama of it started to spiral out around like who was suing, why, like who, what, I just thought like, wow, I, um, like I have to do this. If I don't get the solution, I'm gonna figure out another way to, <laughs> to keep doing this because, um, yeah, I just, again, wanna ask those questions and hope that folks want to ask more questions with me, right? Thank you so much.